Nevada and Placer counties. Welcome to another edition of Nevada County Interviews. I'm your host, Paul Minicucci. Tonight, the subject that we will be exploring is art. Specifically, we'll talk about a new program here at NCTV with, uh, where we're going to be showing um, a series that uh, we have licensed by the National Gallery of Art. Uh, they had a series of something like 60 or so programs that they have produced for the uh, purposes of broadcasting over TV. We applied for a license and we were very pleased to be able to be granted that license. And, and we're going to talk a little bit about how we're going to use these materials inside our school system uh, and developing a new kind of arts education curriculum. And in, in the studio with me is Penelope Curtis. Thanks for coming aboard, Penelope. Thank you, Paul. And so, um, Penelope, before we start, it's always a tradition on the show to learn a little bit more about our uh, friends in Nevada County. So tell me a little bit about yourself. Where were you uh, born? I was born in Phoenix, Arizona. Mm -hmm. And were you raised there, or did you come to California at an early age? No, my father was working at a, uh, in a mine, a copper mine, in Christmas, Arizona. And we lived there for all of about nine months and then moved back to California. Both my parents were Californians and at the time we were uh, living with my grandparents in uh, Palos Verdes and my father was doing work. He's a geologist and was working in the Southern California area. And then uh, my family moved back up to the Bay Area where my father went to Berkeley to get a PhD in geology and taught there. So mm -hmm. I grew up in the Bay Area um, and spent a lot of time in museums in San Francisco when my grandparents would come to visit. I also spent a lot of time in the out of doors. So I grew up as an outdoors person as well as a right. And arts related. Um, and you've been able to carry on those interests to the present day. I know you have yes. interest in, uh, in uh, the natural uh, beauty of this area and hiking and um, the history of this area. Uh, That's right. As well as the arts. So you went to San Francisco State, is that correct? I did. I Tell did. us about that. Well, I started out there in languages. I've always liked languages. I also uh, loved music. I spent most of my time studying in the music library while I studied my languages. And then um, I went on to um, study Latin American uh, pre-Columbian art and um, archaeology culture and got a degree in mm -hmm. that, in an interdisciplinary degree. It was one of the first ones that San Francisco State had back in the early 70s. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you have uh, you've since migrated up here to Nevada County? I did. After 20 years of working in arts uh, management, nonprofit management, I started out working with the San, uh, San Francisco Symphony. Then I uh, worked with the San Jose Symphony. I was the public relations um, director there. And then I went down to the Los Angeles area where I was there for about eight years um, and worked for the Bilingual Foundation of the Arts and Hispanic Arts and Theater Organization and then to the Pasadena Chamber Orchestra where I was the executive director. 
Um, I got tired of driving around on the freeways all the time, and uh, my my two sons were in a teenage and middle school, and they were we were getting a little bit pushed by gangs and so on. I thought I got to get out of here, mm-hmm. so that's when I moved to Nevada County because of its um, nature and also because it's quite a mecca for all of the arts. Right. It's a tremendous amount of talent up here. Now, actually, uh, Penelope and I have known each other for something like 20 years, I think. <laughs> it's been a while, it's yes. It's been a while. And uh, during my time both in the legislature with the Joint Committee on the Arts and then as the Deputy Director of the Arts Council, I worked a lot with state local partnership program, which was really sort of my passion. And right. you were involved in that. Right. I... Uh, Eleven years ago, I became the executive director of the Nevada County Arts Council and uh, um, took over, and that's when we started doing the lobby days. I mm-hmm. think that um, Barry Hesenius really pushed us to get down there and work for um, our, our arts at the state level. Right. And uh, it was certainly an up-and-down process. Right. So now, um, what happened uh, as, as what, what I'll tell the audience, we, uh, as I mentioned, we got the ability to apply for this license um, to uh, broadcast and use the materials from the National Gallery. And I called Penelope up and said, do you think there's a, a program here that we can actually do uh, with local artists and perhaps even an education program? Tell us a little bit about the Arts Council grant that you and I sort of put together? Well, just to go back, the California Arts Council had not only the state and local partnership, but the Nevada County Arts Council also had, uh, for a number of years, the local arts and education program, which at that time helped uh, to bring artists and residents into uh, various schools in Nevada County. Nevada County Superintendent of Schools was the first grant cycle that we had. And when the um, California Arts Council lost its funding, uh, the Nevada County Arts Council lost its arts and education funding. So when, um, as the California Arts Council began to rebuild its grants, they came up with the Creating Public Value. Mm -hmm. And that one um, has an element in it that uh, I saw as an important way for us to reintroduce the um, arts and education into our county so that more students can take advantage of, of what is out there and the National Gallery of Art with the videos and their, uh, their resources with the education resources. Their website is just, you know, a treasure trove of material that can enhance the various videos that right. are part of what the license gave us. Now we're going to um, break down this collection into categories, uh, the first of which I think is going to be talking about uh, art in terms of the physics, basically, of art, object, light, and observer. Right. The uh, This one is really good. It's uh, the um, the cover is of uh, Turner, mm-hmm. who di- has done a great job. And I think we have we can draw that up on there. You go there, um, and in in this one they take this apart in terms of not only how um, the person who is viewing art can look at it from one perspective, but also how the artist develops uh, their painting with regard to the light. And so in the first one, we will look at the, uh, the observer, the person who is looking at the paintings, how they perceive the colors and the light, and then we will look at light and the science of light. Right. And uh, the thing that's very nice with this whole uh, program is that it integrates not only art and uh, creating art, but there really is science in right. the whole art as well. Right, and I think the National Gallery does it 
um, a really good job of putting together experts who can explain these things. Uh, and so we're going to be talking about that, and we're talking to some artists in uh, Nevada County who are particularly adept at using light. Um, yes, we mm -hmm. will be. Yeah. There are a number of artists, uh, two-dimensional artists, who have uh, created fantastic um, landscapes. One in particular is Phil Brown, who does mm -hmm. the Yuba River, and some of his uh, pieces just are very, very reflective of the Yuba, the South Yuba River, and various parts of it, uh, and all the seasons. Right. And um, so what, what uh, actually happens then, a little art history lesson, of course, during the 19th century in Europe, uh, uh, the predominant um, modality was in realistic figurative art in, in much of Europe. That's right. Yeah. Before the, the camera came right. along. Right. Then, then what happened? <laughs> <laughs> then the artist said, well, the camera can take care of it. There's realism. And they started in on uh, experimenting right. with uh, paint in such a way that w it would create a, an illusion, an impression of what was happening. So right. you that was born the Impressionist School. Right. Like and Edouard Monet and perhaps the most uh, prominent artist and Matisse and, Matisse, and they, uh, right. yeah and well and uh, Van Gogh and uh, right. Van Gogh and Cezanne sort of moved more into expressionistic right as, the, as it evolved so um, but when you get into their paintings and the one thing that is nice about the National Gallery's um, interactive website with these videos is that they give the opportunity to really study and get into the depth of of yeah. some of the pieces of artwork, so you can see the brush strokes and the coloring and the different right. um, the different paint, uh, similar paints that give the the tone to the entire painting. If somebody's sitting back there looking at it, now one of the uh, objects of of art that we will be talking about in these series is the Monet, Monet series with both haystacks and the cathedral, right? And, and where he captures the cathedral different times of the day, different times of the year, and he's playing with a palette that goes, you know, completely the spectrum from, yeah. from dark and, uh, you know, earth tones all the way to very light blues and grays. Yes, because he's followed it from morning to evening and, and has really captured those different light textures in the painting. So as you look at them and go through them, you can see how different each one of those is. Um, and also the opportunity to get in and see the brush strokes and the techniques in creating that painting. Right. And then we're going to be exploring a little bit about 20th century. Uh, we have late uh, 19th century European art, which we talked about, uh, Cezanne, uh, for one. And then we're going to be talking about the 20th century. Uh, and uh, I think we have... Uh, there we go. Um, and so naturally we have a Picasso on the cover of this. Uh, and Picasso, in his earlier days, before Cubism, um, was a figurative painting uh, painter. And uh, uh, talk a little bit about that transition between figurative and, and Cubism, if you would. Well, that's a that's a hard one for <laughs> me. <laughs> uh, I think that what we find with Picasso is that he started out with the figurative, but he also like the other artists in the Impressionist and ex um, Expressionist were, he was experimenting and mm -hmm. taking each thing that he was doing and then expanding to see how he could um, create an illusion either through cubism or even from strokes that he would, right. you know, um, look at something and dash it off and and you come back from it, you can see in that dashing off of the stroke just exactly what he was looking at. Right. And the, uh, so he and Brock uh, experimented with using planes of light in three dimension, and that, right. hence the word cubism. And, and, uh, and then at some point, Picasso started um, uh, reintegrating a lot of the expressionist forms of art, and so his uh, the paintings that most people are familiar with are um, 
fractured kinds of uh, looks at like musical instruments and and uh, still lifes and, right. and portraits and portraits. Um, one of the things, though, that is with this whole series and what we will have to do as we're going along is uh, combining artwork from other museums or collections that have been um, reproduced in order to give a picture of someone like um, Picasso because the ones that we have in this on this video uh, are very small, short, because they're the ones that are in the National Gallery right. itself. Right. And, and that's what the whole series is, is really a, um, an in-depth look at the various uh, uh, pieces that are in right. the collection. And we're sort of using it as a launching pad right. for artists and concepts. So one of uh, the things we've been exploring is the Crocker Museum in Sacramento and some of the projects they have. Talk a little bit about their arts education program. Well, I've just started delving into it. They have, um, it's quite extensive. They have a lot of, of uh, additional materials that can enhance the various programs from the National Gallery. They, um, they are more reflective of California art and so when we are talking about something like light, we can uh, uh, get the uh, material from the Crocker that has uh, Bierstedt and some of the others who mm -hmm. were um, very color and light oriented in painting scenes from uh, California. Right. And then another major influence certainly here in California has been Asian art. And I, I know that there's a whole strand of the National Gallery that talks about that? So far the the material that's at the National Gallery is more from an archaeological standpoint right. uh, and they have the they have a series that we have uh, the opportunity to um, uh, view is uh, uh, from Indonesia from China, in the one that they have mm -hmm. on China, it really spends a lot of time on those wonderful warriors. Right. Uh, and then there's a very small segment on uh, Japanese art, and it's only a small portion yes. of the Japanese art. So in in the case of the their ancient art, whether it's the Greek or the Egyptian or what they call the Asian or uh, the uh, Western Hemisphere, there's the a, right. There'll have to be a lot more that is added to it, uh, particularly for studying art uh, right. from an arts education standpoint. And we have people in the county who have uh, been influenced by Asian art and by um, Mexican, right. middle Middle American art. Um, talk to us a little bit about that. I mean. Well, we have someone right now, we've been working with uh, uh, Gary Graham, who teaches uh, mural painting, and he studied, he also studied at San Francisco State and studied all of the, the Mexican muralists before he got um, into teaching and uh, commissioned mural work. The Right now, the class is up at Sierra College, and they're working in the administrative building, uh, creating a, a mural that is reflective of our area here mm -hmm. and how uh, the uh, nature fits into the studies and the art um, as well. And we have um, some of our local videographers are actually uh, documenting this process. Right. Yeah. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to show that on uh, on our Channel 11 at some point when it's uh, finished and uh, produced. It's a massive work, though. It's actually it, two stories high. I mean, it's two stories high. Um, unfortunately, they have to get everything done in the foyer because the class has been um, cut. It's not a core class, right. unfortunately. So it's cut, and they they need to finish. Right. by the end of the semester, by June. Uh, and so I think what they will be doing is to just finish up in that foyer and then have the rest of the, the um, design for some other time. And 
that brings up a good point because we're struggling in the Vedic County as we are all throughout California and indeed through the country, throughout the country, with the massive cuts that are being proposed in education and as well in you know public arts uh, and public media. So you know begs the question as to why uh, why is art so important and and maybe we could spend a few moments talking about uh, how we can uh, help parents understand what's not happening in the schools. Well, I think that um, from this program standpoint, this gives the opportunity for to enhance arts education that is being cut back. And as far as I'm concerned, art is one of the most important elements of any education because it stimulates the creative process. And if we don't have that uh, creativity, we're not going to have the next generation of computers or um, graphics or any of these things right. that we have right now. You know, a lot of people forget that there's a core that maybe a scientist has worked on, but then there's the design that goes on around the outside. That takes a, an artist working with a scientist. Right. And um, for a lot of, of students, they're much more able to comprehend science or math if they have art in their daily lives in school because so much of science and math has to do with, uh, with the arts. For example, people who don't uh, know a lot about murals would be surprised to find out how much mathematics is involved because you basically have to uh, block out the mural and recreate it at a different scale and exactly. that's all calculated by the artist and, and the students. And the students, yes. You know, so. they, they uh, sit down and they get their graph paper and they work it out. They've, they've done the sketches and then they work out the, on the graph um, just how it's going to be. You're looking at the room, how is it going to fit in? And in the case of the Sierra College, you've got four walls some are uh, 30 feet high. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to incorporate windows. Uh, so there are all of these things that they had to look at very carefully and scale properly. Right. And in fact, uh, art, visual art particularly, is all about problem solving. It really is. I don't yeah. know that people understand that. But there's, uh, in fact, I just heard that there was a report that came out um, I think it was AT&T put it out, I'm not sure, about uh, the people who make the best uh, employees happen to be artists and people in the humanities because they know how to analyze uh, creativity and they know how to use creativity to solve problems. So people don't, I don't think, always realize that. I don't think they do either. Yeah. I think that one of the things about uh, uh, people who have spent a lot of time in they're more open-minded, so they're they're looking at things from a different point of view, right. this side or that side or whatever, and having to put it all together, whereas if you have spent a lot of time and have not had the encouragement to be creative but to just sit down and take a test, you lose that um, ability to right. see from a variety of perspectives. It's just, uh, to me, it's very ironic that in the midst of a, a media revolution that's you know, gripped the world with new technology, all of which is visual-based, that right. we are cutting out the very uh, core of understanding new media. Right, and, right. Uh, you know, and, and other countries are beating us to the punch. I mean, I, I study this at uh, great detail, and believe me, the... the uh, D digital media uh, work is leaving our shores and is going to China and Japan and uh, Bangalore and India and Singapore. And uh, those countries are putting together a very robust arts education program so that they can create. So uh, they can be at the, the top yeah. of the heap. Yeah, exactly. And they're stealing our, uh, our basic native industries. It's very sad uh, to me. So... Uh, and one of the things I think that I've spent a large part of my career is to try to get parents 
to understand because, you know, one of the things that I found uh, working at the Arts Council was that parents remember more about their um, education than they really know about their kids. And so they'll That's think true. that there's more art in the curriculum than there actually is. And I'm very stunned to find out that there's virtually, at the elementary level, virtually no arts or science, as it turns out, uh, being taught in our elementary schools. And it's sad, and that's one of the things I learned when I uh, was working with the schools here with the um, local arts and education program is that um, not only do the parents not know, but a lot of the teachers today didn't have it while they were growing up. And so when you start talking about introducing just bare essential of art, they're afraid to do it. So right. that's why that program was really important because it brought right. artists, whether they were musicians or theater or visual artists, into the classroom to um, help the teachers and to encourage the students. Right, and teachers, uh, one of the things that we, when we did uh, evaluation and analysis of that program, we found out that the teachers gained a lot of confidence by being around the artists and really understood they, they didn't have to be artists yeah. to be able to, to teach arts education. And I think that's the important thing, is that you don't have to be an artist. But in my mind, everybody is an exactly. artist. It's just a matter of, of turning the switch at some point where the person says, oh, I can do that. Right. You know, it, it is something that I can do. And I think one of the things with this National Gallery of Art um, series that will help not only with the teachers in our county, but also parents as well, <clears throat> is that it uh, can be interactive and work with the right. um, new Nevada County Digital Media Center right. where we, we, we can say, um, you can go online and here are the areas that right. you can work with um, to uh, help your student or the parents for them to get involved too. Right. And it is. So arts education and education in general will be a big part of the Digital Media Center. We're just about out of time here. I want to thank Penelope Curtis uh, for coming over and talking about um, arts education. Uh, and there will be a lot more about that as we go on in the next few months. So. Uh, this is Paul Manacucci saying, until next time, uh, think good things about art, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Rosemary Betrayler, an experienced business and contract attorney, supporting the integrity of your business relationships. A well-crafted contract is the foundation of every successful business relationship. I can help you put your agreement with others into words that will survive the test of time. Why do people think there's more disagreement in the state legislature than in most families? My brother and I argue about everything, even which TV show to watch. Mom says our elected officials debate important issues every day, and they may argue too, but in the end they compromise, and that's how the best decisions are made. Sometimes it just takes a little give and take to find common ground. I guess it's the same in the state house as it is in my house. It's okay to argue, as long as you're willing to compromise, you know, like when you want to see the Jonas Brothers, but your brother wants to watch SportsCenter. And you end up compromising. And watch the new PBS special with your parents. Am I missing something? Learn more about how compromise works by logging on to www.representativedemocracy.org.
The following program is underwritten by the Nevada Irrigation District. Since 1921, providing clean and healthy drinking and irrigation water to more than 24,000 homes, farms, schools, and businesses in Nevada and Placer counties. Good evening and welcome to another edition of Nevada County Interviews. I'm your host, Paul Manicucci. And tonight in the studios, we're really grateful to have Al Bolf, who is a nuclear engineer and a planner and uh, an advocate for uh, getting us off the fuel and uh, fossil fuel um, sort of treadmill that we find ourselves in. Al, welcome to the studio. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, um, and there's actually going to be more than one part to our show. Tonight we're going to be talking about nuclear energy um, principally, but uh, um, then later we'll come a program about um, electric trains and electricity and, and more about alternative kinds of energy supplies that Al's um, really passionate about, I know, um, and happen to be, I happen to be a big supporter of just about everything Al supports. So, Welcome to the show, Al. And Thank you. Uh, we'll tell the viewers that actually what happened was we had another show had a uh, guest on who was talking about nuclear energy, and uh, you took exception to some of the things he said, huh? Absolutely, yeah. And uh, you know when you when you go get a uh, a a dental X-ray, a full dental X-ray, you're getting 600 millirems. At Rancho Seco, when we were operating. We could not exceed 15 millirems on the on the fence line while the plant was operating at full power. We did an uh, independent study, myself and and uh, one uh, Dennis Gardner, who was uh, our head uh, health physics person at the time. We went down to the Capitol when before they had metal detectors and all the guards down there, and we smuggled in radiac equipment and we measured the amount of radiation in the basement of the Capitol. Uh, and also took soil samples from the flower beds in the basement and found out they exceeded what we were putting out at the fence line at Rancho Seco. Right. And here those politicians were, were you know, they, no, no technical expertise were, were creating these laws uh, mm -hmm. against, uh, against nuclear power, which still are on the books in California, which has restricted right. the, uh, the growth of nuclear power in California. Well, before we get into the subject, tell me how you got... Uh, First involved in uh, nuclear energy, you were uh, you have a double bachelor's degree, I understand. Yeah, I have a I, I don't have a I'm not a, I wasn't a nuclear engineer in the Navy. I was a marine engineer. Right. And uh, I uh, what happened on my first ship, the Princeton, we were involved as a uh, uh, in Operation Dominic. Operation Dominic was a uh, a look see of uh, a tactical testing of tactical nuclear weapons off of Johnson Island. Johnson Island is a 500 miles southwest of Hawaii. There are actually two sea mounts. One is a launch platform and the other is a radio station from these undersea mountains. And we evacuated people off the island and stood by as these missiles were launched into the atmosphere and they exploded these tactical nuclear weapons. Well, I went up, they gave you a dosimeter and which gave you immediate readout how much radiation you were getting and goggles to watch the explosions because I was down in engineering at the time so I went up and watched a bunch of the blasts and that and then uh, later on I got picked for uh, the nuclear power program uh, which is uh, you know I was very honored to be in that program because uh, I got to meet Admiral Rick over at one wow. of the inspections yeah. and of course it was like being in the presence of God he was a very knowledgeable person right. and he demanded exact 
uh, obedience to all the rules and regulations of operating the plants. And that's why the, the nuclear Navy has such a good record, except for the loss of the, the Thresher and the Scorpion, mm -hmm. the two uh, submarines that were lost. Uh, they, uh, they're still today, they're not too sure about what really happened mm -hmm. with the loss of those two submarines. The Russians, on the, on the other hand, uh, lost over 2,000 people on accidents on their submarines. Uh, so we definitely have a better safety record right. in our, our nuclear navy than the Russians do. Right. But and then you went on to uh, spend 39 years working for SMUD. Right, and uh, what happened is I got out of the navy and, uh, and I met uh, Dr. Vreeland. He was a professor of nuclear and electrical engineering at Sac State and he was being attacked by a bunch of anti-nukes one day, so I, I jumped in there and, uh, and uh, helped him out because these, these people that were attacking him just were, uh, they, were they were dwelling on emotional mm -hmm. and generali generalities. They didn't seem to have any exact knowledge. Mm -hmm. So he asked, he, we had coffee later, and, and he asked me if I had any notes uh, from the nuclear Navy training, and I said, yes, uh, I have, uh, I had all these non-confidential notes, and he says, well, could he borrow them? To, uh, for the first uh, group of operators at Rancho Seco, him and, and, uh, and uh, instructor Stockwell from Sac City were training the first group of operators for Rancho Seco. And I had, I had trained on the Enterprise plant. Mm -hmm. And the Enterprise, of course, has eight reactors. And now, of course, it has four because it was a little bit too energetic, a little bit too powerful. In fact, I was on the Enterprise one time, and I asked the, one of the admirals in there if I could water ski behind the ship, and he said, uh, he <laughs> turned me down. He says, no, that wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't be the Navy way. <laughs> but uh, uh, when I, then I went to work at Rancho Seco, and uh, the first job I had there was in public relations. I did that for seven years. And then uh, I went into fuel management, and then uh, tech support, where actually inspected uh, equipment being put together. When I was in fuel management, we went through two refuelings, and I was calling the shots of where they put the fuel assemblies uh, when they, we were changing out in the core. Right. It was a four-unit core. Right. So, uh, well, let's talk, let's get into some of the issues. I mean, sure. I know that uh, from a citizen's perspective, you know, what may be uh, um, in their mind is, you know, first of all, safety issues, of course. Absolutely. And then the second issue I often hear people talk about is the... Uh, inability to handle nuclear waste in any kind of efficient way, or at least that's the perception. So tell me, uh, you were talking to me uh, before we came on the show um, about the difference, for example, between the Japanese plants, uh, how they were constructed, and the, and the model that we would use in the United States, which is much much a sounder and safer model. What what are some of those differences? Well, the, uh, the first reactor in California was Valacitos. The Valacitos has a, a containment uh, structure on it. Mm -hmm. The Japanese Fukushima plants are over 40 years old. The Japanese never built full containment on them. The only containment they had was a, a webbing of, of uh, con or steel I-beams and, uh, and a skin, a metal skin on the building. It wasn't pressure proof. Uh, at Rancho Seca, we had a building that could eight, take 8.5 on the Richter scale and also take a hit from a 747. Now, that building... And this is, this is also uh, the specs I've seen with Enrico Fermi II. Enrico Fermi II is a boiling water reactor, belongs to Detroit Edison. And I was in that plant when it was, this is a, actually a second or third generation uh, uh, modern boiling water reactor. In a boiling water reactor, the coolant is boiled off the top of the core and goes to cyclonic separators and chevron separators. And then that steam is fed, which is, if they have any radioactive leaks or anything, the whole system is radioactive, and it goes directly to the turbines. And the turbines are heavily shielded, and of course you have to have uh, very exacting uh, uh, conditions to work on them. In other words, you have to use anti-seas, you know, you, you, your gloves, double set of gloves, all taped to uniform, and and uh, the, the booties on the, on the shoes, and also in some cases you even will wear respirators to prevent the ingestion of, of radioactive material contamination inside your body, which you don't want. But the Japanese never built that, uh, briefed up that containment. So I, I think after this accident in Japan, it's been so far-reaching, 
And remember, of course, the, the Earth is a closed system, so what happens on one side, you can detect on the other side. When we had the Chernobyl accident, we did an exact uh, uh, set of samples, extra set of samples. I was doing environmentals at that time, and we found parts of that reactor, cesium, strontium, and iodine. We found that on, on the, the leaves of ferns, ferns and thistles. You know, the ferns and, and, the, and thistles on a plant are uh, maximized to absorb as much moisture as possible. That's why they have a greater surface area. Mm -hmm. So we, we found out that the, we found parts of the Chernobyl reactor because the, in the Chernobyl reactor exper, uh, explosion, they had a hydrogen explosion, but they atomized 3% of the physical part of that core. I mean, they contaminated reindeer meat for two years. The, uh, the pistachio crop in Turkey was contaminated. The Finns knew about it because their portal monitors, the radiation monitors at their, at their uh, exits to and entrance to their plants where people have to walk through, uh, went off scale when that happened. And the Russians, of course, wouldn't admit it for a long time. But they eventually had to because everybody was picking up abnormal amounts of, of radioactive material that was being scattered around the globe. But the Japanese plants, of course, uh, were picking up their material too. But right now it isn't as much because they're having some weather, <coughs> excuse me, localized weather where the rain is bringing all that material above their plants and raining right on their farmland locally. Mm -hmm. And there's there going to be a while before uh, people feel comfortable again about eating rice from those rice patties or even uh, the sea, uh, seafood because the Japanese, you know, eat a lot of seafood and of course they're dumping seawater into the plant and when you dump seawater and it's very corrosive uh, and since the parts of a plant are try, uh, trying to uh, kept chemically neutral, in other words, one part per billion in the reactor cooling system is very pure. But when you have carelessness like they did, and you'll have uh, pumping seawater in, you're going to have a great big mess to clean up. And it's going to be years before they they clean that up. And then they should never have built those plants uh, like they did without any containment. In other words, let me show you the Rancho Seco containment was, a, um, was uh, four feet thick on the walls. It had an inch steel liner plate inside and then had 356 cables that uh, kept the building under constant compression. And how we did that, these cable ways were like the cables on the uh, smaller scale on the Golden Gate Bridge or the Bay Bridge, and they hydraulically drew them taut. So in other words, the whole building was under constant compression all the time. Also, we, at Rancho Seca, we had a, we had a negative... Uh, 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 air pressure inside the building. In other words, it's uh, two and a half inches of vacuum all the time. So nothing leaked out, but everything leaked in. And we had backup power sources. We had four different diesel generators. But what's going to happen with this uh, spent fuel building? Now, the spent fuel building, because the Japanese had a problem with the breach of their spent fuel pool, mm -hmm. they're going to have to, they'll probably change the specs of the spent fuel pools internationally as well as in the United States here, we'll probably go to a similar construction as a reactor building. Right. So, I mean, there are going to be um, risks associated with the development Absolutely. of energy, but there is risks everywhere right. for every source that but you the can best, possibly imagine. But the best thing in nuclear power, my friends, you have all these nuclear weapons around. What are you going to do with the nuclear weapons? Those nuclear weapons should be turned into fuel assemblies, and they have been doing this already. It's called Mox Fuel and Browns Ferry back east that belongs to uh, TVA, Tennessee Valley Authority, are, are using Mox Fuel. And one of the Japanese plants had some Mox Fuel in it, too. Mm -hmm. And that's the best way to do away with all this weapon material that everybody has. Mm -hmm. If you make useful fuel assemblies out of it, and uh, start generating electricity and also making fresh water. Right. Now, the, the Arab Emirates now have, have bought the first two of 20 uh, reactors from the South Koreans. 
And they're going to build these reactors in the Arab Emirates because they know that oil is coming to an end and they're going, they need water and power for them to survive, right. to grow their own food there. Right. Otherwise, they'll be subservient to people exporting food. It's like us, you know, when I was growing up in the Loomis Basin was famous for its plums and pears and so on, and now we get our fruit from Chile. Yeah. And that's ridiculous. I mean, to pay all that energy to bring food from point A to point B when we could grow it locally. Right. And we have to do that. Right. And I know one of your points, of course, is that um, we have built a tremendously inefficient and uh, consumer-heavy uh, society. Oh, yes. Always expecting more and more energy uh, because, you know, fossil fuels... Uh, were readily available. In fact, coal still has you know large reserves, and so it's pretty easy to be able to create uh, energy out of it. And I think uh, people around the world just got so used to consumption that's that they right. never thought twice about you know looking at other sources. That's that's the most alarming to me, Paul, because uh, a lot of people follow sports and so on. I don't. I've I've been taught to. Uh, and my father instilled upon my this and my brother too. My brother's a soil engineer. But anyway, uh, uh, we looked at what's going on globally as far as the economics, military, and environmental. And uh, it became, it's becoming very alarming what's going on. I mean, this, the ocean, because of all the CO2 emissions and that, the ocean has turned into a CO2 sink. And the acidity of the ocean is changing. So the, the life expectancy of the mollusk, and the uh, and the coral reefs now is jeopardized because the raising in, uh, uh, acidity of the ocean because we're burning all this uh, uh, fossil fuel emitting all the CO two. I mean, it's getting ridiculous. And the thing is, it's not only the inefficiency of our automobile, which is twelve percent efficient, the engine, but you have to think of the logistics to support an automobile nowadays. Now, if you have a Prius, you have twenty five pounds of rare earths in your Prius. That means to, for the car to, with this material, it's like scandium, yttridium, and, and 14 others. And that makes the electronics of the system operate more efficiently. And uh, it goes into the batteries, and you have lithium. Well, lithium is imported, too, from, uh, right now from Chile and Argentina. Of course, Bolivia has the most lithium, but, uh, you know, Evo Morales wants... Uh, his coca chewing buddies up there to manufacture the batteries in country instead of shipping the lithium carbonate out of country where it's made where the batteries would be made someplace else. So I I can't blame him. I, I you know those people need right. to work. Yeah, I was going to say it doesn't sound like necessarily a bad. A bad <laughs> no, thing I, the thing is that we're getting more we're getting more uh, depending on these outside resources and it takes right. energy and and. Uh, Let's say we've educated the rest of the world, like, you know, the one and a half billion people in China and over a billion people in India that uh, they, they want to live like us now. Right. And do, and I don't, people don't realize that it takes more energy to process our waste from our septic systems and our sewage disposal systems. In India, they generate 220,000 tons of biosolids every day. They don't have these sophisticated sewage systems that we have, and they're trying to attain them. <laughs> I mean, let's, let's get real, folks. Uh, there's 7 billion people on this planet this year. Right. And so, now a lot of people um, will talk to you um, who, are, who are also advocates of getting off fossil fuels, but they may have an unrealistic expectation about alternative fuels. So tell us what's the, you think, the maximum percentage of at current consumption levels that uh, wind power and, uh, um, you know, solar power and uh, bio uh, fuels and even uh, hydroelectricity. How much can we expect those sources to actually contribute? Well, uh, I tell you what, the wind power uh, with the, with SMUD, the SMUD has built a lot of wind generation in the in uh, Solano County and uh, in the uh, what they call the Montezuma Hills down there. The thing is, when they need air conditioning load, those uh, those wind generators aren't running. Right. 
And that's, of course, is a big push to build uh, Iowa Hill pump storage. The Iowa Hill pump storage should have been built at the same time that the SMUD built all those hydros under Bechtel uh, in the 50s and 60s up in uh, El Dorado County. But they didn't do it at the time. So now with all those vacation homes up there around uh, uh, Slab Creek where they want to build this big pump storage, there's a lot of people up there that don't want this cone-shaped reservoir in their backyards. I mean, they still want a view of the Sierras. But the thing is, now the, the cost of that is, is keeps moving up, uh, and uh, of course it's needed, but uh, the thing is, uh, there's, there's, there has to be... There has to be some give and take with all this going on. So we're never, I mean, we're not, we're not in a position to expect anytime soon that these alternative fuel sources will be more than, what, 20, 30 percent of our... No, according to uh, the, uh, the head dispatcher at SMUD, it's, it, gets, it gets real difficult to try to get these uh, the solar cells and the wind generation to come in uh, when they're needed. Yeah. And it just, uh, and the solar is nice, and the, the thing with solar, they should not build fields out in the boonies somewhere. They should build them where, the, where, the, where there is consumption in the cities. In other words, shopping centers, you have all this big roof area. The thing is, in the SMUD district alone, it, uh, SMUD roughly uh, is all of Sacramento County, the power that we bring into it, we lose about 18% by transmission losses. Mm -hmm. So if you put a so, bunch of solar cells out in a boonie somewhere that's uh, maybe five to six or maybe a little bit more up into, as they get more sophisticated, up to 10% efficiency, and then you bring that power from point A to point B, you're going to lose a percentage of it. So why not put those solar cells and even the wind generator incorporated into the building? I've seen uh, the, uh, the Chinese now in their, a lot of their cities, they're building buildings and they're incorporating right away these uh, wind generators into the tops of these high right. buildings, right. which makes a lot of sense. Right. And so I think the bottom line is with current consumption, and even if we were to reduce consumption somehow universally by 10%, let's say, you're still going to need uh, some massive source of energy to backfill the loss of, of, uh, of fossil fuels, right? Oh, absolutely. And then, you know, people take for granted the cheapness of natural gas. But guess what? The Canadian I just read recently, the Canadians now are rethinking exporting more natural gas to us. They're, they've just completed a liquefied natural gas port in British Columbia on the Pacific side, of course. And uh, they're thinking uh, they can get more for their liquefied natural gas if they ship it to China and Japan. Now, I, I've heard uh, that it is, it is very viable that liquefied natural gas in these big tankers and that, uh, the guy who is piloting the ships from, say, Indonesia to the United States, the Simper Energies uh, facility in Baja, California, which is a brand new liquefied natural gas facility, if he gets word that he can pay, uh, get paid more for that natural gas in, uh, in, um, in Tenzin, China, or Yokohama, Japan, guess what? He's going to change course in that ship, and he's going to go to that port. And guess what? We're, we're going to get the short end of the stick here in the United States. So we have about uh, three or four minutes left in our half-hour program. So, so for us, you know, anybody who um, understands this issue, it's a public relations question and challenge, though, to get the United States public to understand that the nuclear energy itself can be contained and used safely if you design the uh, you know the uh, generating plants correctly. Yes, and also let me tell everybody too, nuclear energy is recyclable. Ninety percent can be recycled, and I've been in plants where they did that before Jimmy Carter shut it down. It was Morris, Illinois. It was a reprocessing plant for spent fuel from boiling water reactors in Morris, Illinois, run by GE. And then I was in the when I was in nuclear training in the Navy in Idaho. They had reprocessing facilities there for the spent fuel coming off of nuclear ships and submarines. So it can be recycled. The, the, uh, the French are doing it at Marcole 
And, of course, the North Koreans know how to re reprocess spent fuel because that's where they get their weapon material. Right. And, of course, the, uh, the Iranians are learning, too. And it, it's more viable to reprocess that fuel into new fuel assemblies because it is wasteful to put plutonium in the ground in, uh, in the spent fuel assembly, put it in Yucca Mountain. That is the biggest waste of, of money there is. It should be reprocessing. Reprocessing is the best way to, because 90 plus percent of that spent fuel assembly can be recycled. So in the next two years, let's say, what would your advice be to Congress? What's the first step? We've got about two minutes left, Al. So okay. What's the first step we should be taking uh, on um, creating safe nuclear power in this country? Well, they, you know, even Admiral Rickover advocated this, too. Admiral Rickover advocated that everybody be on their toes all the time. And, and you know, that's, that's the whole secret of, of a credible industry. I don't care if you're operating a nuclear power plant or you're operating a bunch of refineries uh, at the Carquinez Straits because you have a problem in one of those refineries, you're going to have a problem here. And we have to remember that... Uh, Two to 3,000 tons a year of mercury is coming from our coal plants, and we get 40% of our electricity from coal. We even get, uh, we're even getting radiation from uh, the natural gas. Everything that comes from the planet's core is uh, radioactive, radioactive uh, radon, tritium. I mean, That's let's... Occurring. Yeah, it's naturally occurring, and, and uh, everybody has a little bit of radiation in their body. If you don't, then you're from some other planet, and they probably have their own <laughs> source of radiation there because, you know, uh, a lot of the, the heat in the core of the planet is from the decay of radioactive materials. Right. So, Al, next time you come aboard, we're going to talk a lot about uh, electricity and uh, how electric uh, rail uh, transportation plans um, um, are a way for us to go uh, and so I look forward to seeing you come back in a couple of weeks if we can get you to come back. Well absolutely because you know auto I look at automobiles as captive resource units when I think of all the resources and all logistics to keep that automobile on the road independent of the fuel and lubricants <laughs> let's let's get real folks. Yeah well thank you Al, Al Buff, and uh, th thanks for coming aboard that's all we have time for tonight and um, uh, you know, I think it's fair to say that uh, in these times of uh, hard economic times that we do have to uh, be able to uh, find uh, new and innovative sources of energy that drive up costs of almost anything. So that's about all we've got time for tonight. Um, I'm your host, Paul Minacucci. Looking forward to seeing you next time. Bye-bye. NCTV thanks the following underwriters for their very generous support. Williams Stationery. For 59 years, the Williams family has been providing our community a comprehensive full line of business and personal office supplies, social stationery, janitor.